Won't you open your Bibles to, where are we going? One, uh, John chapter 1. I want to start something new today, and I'm going to really lay a foundation, and then we'll just kind of move out from this place. I like to lay foundations for things because I think that it gives people context. Um, and I think that, you know, when Jesus, when Jesus taught, Jesus often used parables. Parables are just stories with a meaning. But I think parables are important because in our everyday life, sometimes it's very easy for people to give us truth, but it's not always that easy to digest because we're kind of trying to find a point of context for us. And sometimes stories make it a lot easier for us because when people give us something, we have an area that we're able to digest it in and we've got a grid that we kind of can see what God's trying to do in those things. So I really want to go into, um, kind of wander into that territory a little bit today, but I want to set things up for the next few weeks on what we're going to be speaking about. In John chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading from verse 1, and it says, As it is written, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I want to, I've called this morning, and what I want to start speaking about is something called the visible image of the invisible God. The visible image of the invisible God. People want to know God, and people are looking for a context for God. People are trying to discover and get clarification or an introduction to who God is. And there is built on the inside of us an appetite to pursue those things. And people are looking for something like that. People are looking for a sense of reality. They're not looking for a religion. They're not looking for a theory. They're not looking for an ideology. They're looking for a relationship. Relationship separates all of those other things because it's about a sense of knowing. It's about a sense of conviction. It's about coming to a place of, of interaction between two entities. It's a relationally based thing. People want to know God. There are people out there who are in pursuit to try and understand if there is such a thing as a greater being. And if that greater being does exist, what does that greater being look like? Because until I can get to the place where I actually know and, and have a grid for God, people sit there and they, and they wonder, does he actually exist? It's easy to be a person who buys into the ideology or the thinking that there is no God when you've never had knowledge of a God. Knowledge in the context of an interaction, an, an interaction or a, a reality. Even people who know of God, the question is, to what degree do we want to know God? Because the more you know God and the more intimate you, you, you are in relationship with him, it's supposed to have an effect and an influence on our life. So the more you know God, the more intimate you are with him, the greater comprehension and understanding you have with him, the more it is designed to influence your life and your being and who you are. So we're kind of on this journey to try and discover who he is and what he's all about. And we're wondering where that is and how it works. We're trying to find a grid for our life. We're trying to find and pinpoint areas of truth so that we can walk into what exactly does that mean. But on the other end, it's important for us to know that although that's where we might be, God is 100% committed to you. God says... I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. The prosperity of your soul is dependent on your ability to know God. In essence, what he's saying is, the more that we know God, the more that we are aware of God, the greater role that he plays in, in our life, the more that we're going to walk into blessing in our lives. So it's important that we know that God is committed to that, and that's where God is. People never cease to leave me befuddled at times. Have you ever realized that because of the journey that you walk in life, we have a grid for life that, we, that, that gives us context to our sense of normal? And your sense of normal is different to everybody else's sense of normal. And everybody who doesn't conform to your sense of normal is a bit odd. Have you noticed that? We don't think we're odd because we think we're normal because we have our history. 
But nobody else has our history, but we don't have their history. So we think we're normal and they're odd, and they're sitting thinking from their perspective, I'm pretty normal, but you're pretty odd. It's an interesting thing because we go through life and we realize that people make decisions and we're not always aware of why people do what they do. And sometimes when we see what people do and the decisions that, we, that they make, it perplexes us and sometimes it, it, beyond confusion, we actually left there wondering how could you do something so silly? And that's being polite. Sometimes it's just outright dumb. But people do things, but we don't really understand why they do what they do. The people who grow up in homes that are good, that are healthy, that are secure, were places where they loved and they're taken care of, places where they're provided for, and everything that they have seems to be available and accessible to them. And yet, they'll do silly things and make silly choices, like decide that they're going to do, what they're going to do is leave home and go and shack up with their husband, with this boyfriend of theirs, in the middle of who knows where, with absolutely nothing. So they have no sense of security, no income, limited opportunities, educa education compromised, and you sit there and you think to yourself, why would you do something so dumb? And we're perplexed. And we don't understand why somebody would do something like that. People do odd things all the time. People do things that we look at them and we sit and say, I can't understand why you'd be prepared to make a decision like that. There are people who have so much available to them and yet they find themselves in a place where they are perpetually hooked on substances, on alcohol. And you sit and you look at it and you think to yourself, but why would you do that? Because look at the state of your life. Look at the caliber of where you are right now. I can't understand and I can't get to that place where you're prepared to let go of so much potential and so much opportunity to embrace a decision that's going to leave you at a place where you're kind of stuck in the mud of life. And you realize that until you've really lived in somebody's shoes, you can't understand and have an appreciation for the decisions that they make. Everybody is walking their walk and their journey in life, and everybody's going certain places, and everybody has got a history that we don't have. And people have had things put into them that we don't have. And some people have big deficits because some things that they should have had put into them, they never had the opportunity to. Some people grew up in really dysfunctional homes. People who thought they were so normal, but they were so off the scale that they never had what it was to invest and to put into young kids. And they grow up and they make really silly decisions. But we don't understand that because we have a look at the decision, but we're not aware of the cause and the reason for that. Because we've never been along their journey. We don't understand why people do what they do. But the inherent trap that we fall into is that when we see people like that, what we end up doing is we look at people and we make an assessment as to who that person is based on their behavior. What we do is we look at their life and we sit and say, because you do this, you must be this kind of person. Because you made that decision, I'll label you that way. We look at the way people interact with things. We look at the way people decide. We look at the things that people are engaging. And very often because it's outside of our scope of understanding and because it's outside of our realm of empathy, we label that in a certain way. And the, cha the, the challenge that we have is this. We step into a realm called assumption. And assumption is a dangerous thing. Because what assumption really means is, I'm going to look at the outputs of your life, I'm going to look at the fruit of your life, and I'm going to label you in a certain way. I really don't know who you are, though. I'm not at a place where I understand the deeper things of your life. I'm just having a look at the circumstances, and I'm gaining an impression, and I'm assuming that's who you might be. That's why people talk about first impressions count. What is first impressions all about? I'm going to be introduced to somebody and the way that you interact with me at that point is going to give me some kind of an idea as to who you were. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume you're a certain type of individual. And very often those assumptions are wrong. What's the point? The point is we do the same thing with God. Too many people 
really don't know God. What they do is they use their experiences in life to label God. And we operate off assumptions. So what ends up happening is I go through life and some situation doesn't work out the way that I thought it should have worked out. And something that I was hoping for maybe blew up. And maybe I don't really understand certain things in life and why they work out the way they do. And so what I do is I begin to assume that God is not really a loving God, but God is a judgmental God. And what I'm doing all the time is I'm using assumption as a label to interpret my circumstances and my situation and to give God some kind of a category in my life. What I'm really doing is I'm forming belief systems in my life and in my heart as to who God is all about. And I live out of those paradigms. Sometimes I'm faced with disappointment. And I don't really understand why things didn't work out the way that I thought they should have worked out. And then I start to categorize and look at my life and I start assuming once again that because I never did certain things, really what God is doing is God is just paying me back and I'm earning what is due to me because God is not forgiving in my life. And so it puts me into a place where because I've made an assumption about God, I step into a paradigm where all of a sudden I'm always trying to please God, but I never can step into the righteousness of who God is all about because I'm living by a label that was based on assumption, not truth. We do it with God very often. We live in, in the context of assuming and, and ascribing certain things to God based on our circumstances and our interactions with life rather than knowing who he is and understanding who he is. It's a dangerous place to be because it sets us up for a paradigm for living that is outside of truth, but it defines what our future looks like. We recognize people because of their world. I recognize you because you're the person who lives up the street. I recognize you because you're the person who went to so-and-so high school. I recognize you because you were the great football player and you were the one who was accomplished at reading. I recognize you because you perhaps the one who is the most successful pe uh, uh, salesperson. I recognize you because of your accomplishments and because of your failures and because of your involvements in different aspects of life. I can recognize your life because of your world and your interactions. But I only get to know you through your words. The most sacred place to who you are is what happens on the inside of you. The most sacred place in the holy of holies of our life is a place called our heart. And the things that transpire and the things that take place in our heart are most important to us because they are invisible, they're not accessible to the senses, and yet they're the key drivers of our life. I don't know you unless you give me access to that space. And the only way that you give me access to that space, the most sacred part of your life, is when you use your words. Because your words take the concepts and the truth that's inside of you and it presents it in a way that I can understand it. When you speak to me about why you did the things you did, all of a sudden it brings a degree of understanding to me where I never had that before. You see, the things that constitute our innermost being are things that are elusive to the senses, and yet they're powerful drivers. What are the things that you fear in your life? I fear tomorrow. I fear what people think. There are fears on the inside of us that are very real. And the problem with it is it introduces us to behaviors where we become people who are reticent and we're people who don't embrace opportunity and we're people who are always standing back in the shadows. And what we can do is we can so easily take a look at your behaviors and label you and work off assumptions. But if I understand basically what's on the inside of you and I understand what's driving that, it goes beyond just a recognition of who you are. It gets to a place of knowing what you're all about. I can recognize you through your world but I know you through your words. Your words will speak to me about the inhibitions that you have. Your words are going to speak to me about the dreams, things that right now are intangible, but things that you're hoping for and that you're looking for, things that you want to define your future and how your future looks. The insecurities, the things that are pervasive and run around on the inside of us. 
the optimisms, the things that I'm passionate about, that I'm prepared to put my energy and everything that I want into it. It's when I touch the invisible aspects of your life. When you prepare to open your heart, when you prepare to use carriers called words and take those things and communicate it to me, what it does is it builds something called understanding. Understanding is important because what, I'm, what understanding does is it starts to cultivate a part to who I am, which builds something called intimacy. Intimacy, if you look at the entomology of the word, intimacy is all about making apparent or making familiar what is inside. Making familiar what is inside. I can't get inside of you unless you give me access to that space. I don't know who you are and what you're about. I don't know what your intentions for life are unless you open up that gateway and you use words to communicate that and you give me access to that space. But when you give me that access to that space, it starts to build something called intimacy. All of a sudden, I'm able to connect with you at a deeper level beyond what you're doing and your behaviors and your actions and your decisions. And I can connect with the very heart of who you are. Your key drivers and the things that, that motivate your life. It gives me an appreciation and an empathy for who you are. It builds intimacy. Intimacy, a point of connection point of connection, a point of knowing. When you know somebody, the reason I'm prepared to make myself vulnerable and the reason I'm prepared to take the things that are most sacred to me and I'm prepared to invest them in your life through my words is because I trust you. The intention is if I take those things that are most sacred to me and I impart them to you, I'm looking for you to value and appreciate that. And I'm believing that it's going to bring change in your life. It's not about placing value judgments on what's resonant within people's lives. I'm not talking about sitting saying, is it scriptural, is it not? Is it right, is it wrong, is it black, is it white? I'm talking about coming to places of understanding and places of connection with people where you have a true appreciation and you have a, an opportunity to connect with the very heart and, of who that individual is. Because you see, if you trust me to invest in me, what it can do is if I allow it to, it can change me. And so the way that I interact with you gives me access to your life. And I will deal with you in different ways. Because I'm not just taking your behaviors and labeling it. I understand why you do what you do. I understand why you think the way you think. Whether I agree with it or not. God wants to give us access to his heart. What God's saying is, you're not going to know me by appraising the world around you because you run the risk of running into assumption. You may be wrong, but there's a strong likelihood you'll be wrong. You may be right, but there's a strong likelihood you'll be wrong. And if you get it wrong, You'll run off through life with a predisposition that's erroneous. And you'll prevent me from operating in your life. And you'll preclude yourself from stepping into areas of blessing that I want to give to you. Because you've never moved into truth. You're stuck in assumption. So God says, I don't want you to do that. What I want you to do is I want to share my heart with you. But I know to share my heart with you, to share those innermost thoughts and my intentions, to share those things that are most sacred and my, my real design for your life, I've got to give you something so that you can take that and that you can have an appreciation, so that you can gauge where I, what I'm giving you, so you can get understanding. It can build intimacy and result in knowledge. Knowing me. He recognized the value of the word. So when he says, in the beginning was the word, what he's saying is, I'm looking for an avenue and I'm looking for an opportunity to commune with you. I'm looking for an opportunity to give you an understanding as to who I am and what I'm all about. When it says the word became flesh, uh, sorry, when it says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. There's some things that are really important about that. The one thing is this. It was separate for, from God, but it was the same as God. 
It doesn't say God was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and it was God. What is he talking about? It's talking about Jesus. Jesus was the Word. But there's something really important about the Word because the Word that God created there, and if you have a look in the original um, Hebrew and what it's all about, it transcends our, our simple superficial understanding of what Word is all about because we use words as a, communication, as a vehicle for communication, to take an idea, to take a concept, and to convey that concept to somebody else. And although at one level it does have that, but the thing about it is when God says was the Word, and the word was God. What he's talking about is this. I want you to get the concept of who I'm all about. But at the same time, I need for you to recognize that my words are powerful. And so it's not just a case of me communicating the concept. But the word became what it was. The word became what it was. So when Jesus walked the earth, what, it, what was it? The word made flesh and dwelt among us. What was he saying? What he was saying was every concept, every idea that God was, Jesus used that as an opportunity to communicate to us, this is who God is. But he wasn't only communicating who he was, he was living it because he was it. So he didn't just speak about be holy as I am holy. He was holiness. He wasn't just communicating the need to be holy. Holiness is completion in the context of God. When you are holy and you are complete in yourself, you're not susceptible to things. That's why Satan had no opportunity with Jesus when he tried to tempt him in certain ways. And Jesus said, I don't need that because I'm complete in myself. I'm holy. I don't need that for completion. I don't need that to make me somebody. I don't need that to give me uh, some kind of presence or anything else. I am who I am. I am holiness and completion in who I am. That's the whole point of holiness. That's why God says be holy. When you're complete in yourself, you're not going to be a person who's susceptible to fall into different traps. Because you don't need that to feel complete. He didn't just speak to us about holiness. He was holiness. He didn't just speak to us about righteousness. He didn't speak to us about getting our lives in a place where we are, are in right standing with God. He was righteousness. He was the very personification of everything that he spoke about. The power of the word is not only to communicate an idea, but to become the idea. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's talking about being righteous. I only do the things I see the father do. What is he saying? Everything that the father is, is who I model. That's what I'm all about. If you have a look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus is the exact likeness of God. Jesus is the visible representation of the invisible God. Part of the reason that Jesus came, yes, he came to die for us. Yes, he came to set us free. Yes, he came to give us an opportunity to once again step into a relationship with God. But you needed some kind of definition as to what that meant. What does relationship mean? Or oh, we'll have a relationship. What does that mean? It's so nebulous. It's so airy-fairy. And it's open to interpretation. Part of the reason that Jesus came was to model the word, was to sit and say to us, listen, let me speak to you and let me express to you the heartbeat of God. Let me tell you what it's all about. Why did he teach? Why did he talk? Because he was taking the Logos. He was the Logos. What he was doing was he was creating a grid for our life so that we could look at him and we could say, oh, I see what God is like. Gee, I see what God's intention is when it comes to handling this situation. Gee, I know what God wants my life to look like. Gee, I have an idea and I have a grid. I have a point of reference as to how I can have relationship with him because I know who he is. But beyond the Logos, it was the rhema. The rhema was important because it's not just about having a grid and knowing what God's intention is. It's not just setting a vision before us and sitting saying, that's where I want you to be and that's what I want you to look like. It's about the rhema which is transformational, which changes us and makes us the word. The logos will make you new, but the rhema will give you life. 
Jesus was the Logos. When you get born again, what happens? You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you become recreated. You become a brand new being. But from that moment onwards, what he's looking for is he's looking for you to have an introduction to his word. And he's looking for you to have two things. Every time you walk into a concept of God, an aspect of his being, what he's saying is, let me present to you an idea as to what this is all about. If you bake a cake, nobody just says, put this in there, put that in there, mix it and hope for the best. Because you don't know what it's going to end up like. What do you do when you make a cake? You page through the book and you go, that looks nice. Your eyes get you before the recipe does. But why? Because I know where I'm going. I think I'm getting a chocolate cake. In the meanwhile, I'm just throwing ingredients in, and the next thing I end up with a loaf of bread. And it's like, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but that's why the Logos and the Rhema are important. Because the Logos is all about sitting saying, let me give you a grid for God. When I talk about righteousness, what I'm saying to you is I want you to understand what it is. So that he can take every aspect of your being, and he can walk you into fullness and wholeness and a representation of the Christ on the inside of you. He gives you a picture of what he, he's showing you what the cake looks like. And then what he says to you is, not only am I going to show you what the cake looks like, but you know what? I'm going to bake the cake for you. That's where the rhema comes in. Because the rhema is all about revealing what the cake looks like on the inside of you so that it takes root and it begins to grow and it becomes an expression in your life of the cake that you're dreaming of. If you don't go that way, you end up in works. Because what you do is you see the vision and you think, let me try and bake my own cake. Rhema is all about dependence on the word to change me and to manifest itself in me. It's all about a life of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why? Because everything that he's offering us is available to us and accessible to us. But it's something that he's going to do. And he's saying, can you depend on me to make that happen in your life? Jesus is committed to his original design for your life. Jesus is committed. God is committed to his original design in your life. Jesus actually made you. You know that. God had the concept. Jesus spoke it into being. And the Holy Spirit did the creation. Jesus actually created you. He's committed to his original design for you. The reason that Jesus came, because Jesus, the visible representation of the invisible God, the Word became flesh, so that flesh could become the Word. The reason he came was to sit and show to us exactly what God's intention was for who we should become. And then what he was saying was, not only am I giving you a picture of what God's design is for your life, but I'm introducing you to what your future is. And your future is not what you think it might be. Your future is all about who he is. The flesh becoming word. In the beginning... God created, and God said, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our likeness. There's your destiny, right there. Let us make God, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our likeness. And we lost our destiny. And man is confused, and man's looking all over the place for what he should be, or how he should be, or how he should act, or what he should get involved in, or what career he should follow, or how much education he should get, or how much money he should earn, or what neighborhood he should live in. And none of it is your destiny. Let us make God, let us make man in our likeness and in our image. That is your destiny. The heartbeat of God and God's heart when he expresses it through Jesus is to sit and say, I'm calling you back to your destiny. I'm calling you back to your purpose. I'm calling you back to my original design for your life so that you should be God-like. You're not to be a God, you're to be God-like. Ephesians 4 verse 24 says, put on the new self created to be like God. In true righteousness and holiness. 
in true righteousness and holiness. You are to be like God. You are to be in his image and in his likeness. You're not to be God. You're to be like him. That's what it says. Why? Because he's committed to your purpose. He's committed to your destiny. He's committed to where you're going. And what he says is, I've done everything that I can to make that happen. And if you can connect with my heart, you'll discover your destiny. If you can connect with my words, if you can connect with the visible representation of who I am, you'll get a picture for what your future should look like. You'll get a picture for what your life should look like. You'll get a picture for what your identity should look like. You'll get a picture for what you should accomplish. You'll get a picture for your purpose. You'll get destiny. You'll get destiny. God was always committed to an original game plan. And man messed it up. But God's plan didn't change. Before the foundation of the earth, he had already made provision for the mess up so that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God's word is powerful. God's word does incredible things. It reveals to us the heartbeat of God. And it reveals to us God's truth of who he is. What he's saying is, don't leave the interpretation of who I am up to assumptions. Don't read into your situations. Don't read into your circumstances. Don't read about what's going and then think you can interpret who I am. Because you will end up at a tangent somewhere else. Listen to my word. Because my word comes from my heart and my word comes from the very core of my being. It's the holiest place within me and it gives you a picture as to who I am. It gives you a picture as to what I'm about. It gives you a picture as to how I see your relationship and mine operating together. It's going to give you vision, it's going to give you purpose and it's going to give you power. It operates on more than one level. It's just not about giving you vision but it's about equipping you. The word carries with it the power of transformation. So that we can step into what he's called us to be. So that we can step into our, identi our identity. Our destiny. I'm a new creation in Christ. It means something. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It means something. That is the heartbeat of God having expression through my life. I want to talk next week about, in a more practical sense... How God uses his word to touch our lives and to change us. And we have a role to play in that. Everything's available to us. The sower sows the word. The word's available. But what we do with it and how we partner with God becomes really important. Because it either opens the gateway for us to walk into blessing and God's design and God's purpose. Or we can preclude God and prevent him from working in our lives. But everything is dependent on where the word is and how the word operates. And when we step outside of God's design, when we step outside of wo the word, we step into religion. Because then I'm trying to do some stuff that really was the Holy Spirit's job. <laughs>